Hello? Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good. I am Satish Chandra. I am an engineering manager at Facebook. So my team's mission is to support our developers by giving them tools to help them be as productive as they can be. So let's uh, just uh, jump right in. Uh, we know that machine learning has had a transformational effect on almost every major industry that we know of. But what about software development as an industry itself? Even though developer time is kind of the scarcest of resources out there, machine learning has yet had to have any kind of impact on the practice. So today, we are uh, delighted to tell you what we have done in recruiting the vast potential of machine learning in software development itself. So we know that machine learning generally requires large amount of data on which to do its training and, um, and find patterns. But consider the amount of data generated during software development at a large software company. For example, us. We, we have large number of developers, thousands of developers, who write, who do lots of code searches, run large number of tests, do lots of code commits to a large body of code, and innovate on products that are used by billions of people. And that's a large number as well. So this is all data from which machine learning can extract patterns and insights that can help our developers. So let us uh, start with considering the life of a noob. So in Facebook, in Facebook terminology, a noob is one of our incoming employees, so we call them noobs. <laughs> our noob is trying to come up to speed with our code base, and as I mentioned before, it is a large code base. So our noob is uh, looking to write some code in hack programming language to calculate, for example, some kind of time zone difference. Of course, he can go ahead and read the documentation and figure it out, but really, do you really read documentation for these things? Who does that these days, right? What we really like to do is to look at some sample code that kind of does something related and then just adapt that code for our use. And there is nothing wrong with that. It's a great way to make progress quickly. So it is a fair bet that in our large code base, there is some code snippet somewhere that is about some concept related to what our noob was looking for. If the noob is able to find that code snippet, he will be able to make rapid progress. Now, now notice that you could think of the large code base as an hindrance, or as we do here, we are looking at the large code base as a resource. So let's see how. So the technology question that we want to answer is that, how do you quickly find related code in a large code base, starting from an informal query, the kind of query that you would ask on Stack Overflow? In other words, can we make our repository just talk to us? Turns out now it can. So today, we are going to show, share with you a new technique called neural code search that uses ideas from natural language processing and applies those ideas to code. In a few minutes, my colleague Sonia will uh, come on stage and tell you more about how neural code works and what it accomplishes. Now, one of the aspects of searching for code is also searching for API usage. In a typical development scenario, a developer has to work with several frameworks, possibly large frameworks, and they have to know about a large number of API functions uh, defined in those uh, frameworks. Of course, some of those functions can be common knowledge, and you don't need any kind of code assistance to look up those functions. And some other functions are fairly esoteric, so it's okay to go find out more details about them 
when you need them. But then there is also this large category of functions in the middle of these two extremes where a developer might need them often enough, but still cannot keep information about all of them on their, finger trip, uh, on their fingertips. So this is a more specialized form of code search, and we have built code assistance technology for this kind of uh, code search as well. So imagine, imagine that you are an Android developer, and you are interested in, say, the bitmap factory API of Android, and specifically, you want to know how decode stream is supposed to be used. So one way is to go on, for example, GitHub search and just search for that API name. And if you did that, you will get a large number of results. You can look at a few of them, but they tend to be repetitive. So in the end, looking through this very long list is not the most productive way to go. So is there a better way? Uh, turns out there is indeed a better way. We are going to talk about a new tool called Aroma that looks at lots of course scars, lots of repositories, perhaps thousands of them, and presents a clustered view of search results. So instead of going through search results one by one through a long list, what you are going to see is a small number of distinct usage patterns that you can go through. So here, for example, on this um, visual, you see that Aroma is presenting essentially five different clusters of results, and you just can go through uh, each of them, just five of them. And in, with each result, it also shows you which files show usage of that category. So that's, uh, that's a much more efficient way of finding API uh, usage information. Now you might wonder why the name Aroma. So the story there is that uh, at some lunchtime we are having this discussion about the relationship between smell and memory. Anyone know about it? So th that's, that's where we got the name Aroma, so that's, that's Aroma. So in a few minutes, my colleague Frank will take you through details of Aroma, how it is implemented, what it accomplishes, and so on. There's one more thing. So we, we, we talked about code search, but remember that we also spoke about that we have a very large code commit history. So what can you do with code commit history? In fact, code commit history is a gold mine of information because it contains all the code changes ever made to our code base. So if you can unleash machine learning at the code commit history as well, perhaps it can find some interesting patterns and then put those patterns to good use. Hmm, but what's a good use? What can it do? Turns out that fixing bugs is a good use. So if, if your small code changes have a pattern and if those code changes are about bug fixes, perhaps machine learning can learn to recognize those patterns and offer fixes to bugs, open bugs, uh, automatically. So here is an example of an actual bug fix that our new tool called Getafix uh, offers, Getafix. Get a fix offers. It suggests this fix shown uh, highlighted on this visual automatically. So, in fact, what you saw the code fragment on the screen is the fixed code fragment, but the highlighted portion, which is in fact the correct fix in this case, was mechanically generated uh, by Get a fix that learns from lots of past bug fixes. So, that's the value of. Uh, getting information out of commit history. In a few minutes, my colleague Johannes will uh, come on stage and tell you more about Getafix. So I mentioned code search, I mentioned Aroma, that's about API usage, I mentioned automatic bug fixing, the Getafix project, but these are just some examples of how you can use machine learning uh, to build interesting developer productivity tools, but there is a lot more. You can, for example, use 
these kind of ideas for, say, auto completion or even for optimizing uh, continuous integration uh, processes. So there is a lot of potential here. And we believe that ML is poised to have a significant or to be a significant force multiplier in the area of developer productivity. I hope that we can <laughs> convey some of our excitement about this topic uh, to you today. So in the rest of this presentation, we'll share, you, share with you some more technical details about these three projects that I, uh, about which I gave you a preview just now. Neural code search, code recommendations using Aroma, and get a fix for uh, bug fixing. These are simple but effective applications of machine learning that we hope that you can adapt and use in your own domains as well, uh, in your own development processes and tools. Further details uh, on each of these are available in papers and blogs, and in the last slide of this presentation, we'll show the links to those papers uh, and blogs. So with that, let me invite my colleague Sonia to present to you Neural Code Search. Thank you, Satish. Hi, everyone. I'm very excited to be here today. And in this part of the talk, I'm going to be talking about Neural Code Search, or NCS, as I'll be referring to. Before I get into the nitty gritty details of NCS, let's kind of take a step back and look at a broader picture. If you are a developer, you have probably heard of the site called Stack Overflow, right? And you probably use it quite frequently. And one of the reasons why developers love Stack Overflow is that even if you're not very familiar with the code or don't know exactly what to search for, you can ask a question in natural language and get back code snippet answers that relate to that query. You know, it's even become a joke that developers can't function without Stack Overflow. They depend on it every day. If this is the case, is there even a need for NCS, another code search tool? Isn't our work basically done? Well, let's think of a slightly different scenario. Let's go back to the example that we saw in the intro. We have a new peer at Facebook. And this developer is coding in a language that is not very well known to the outside world, such as hack. So if this, this developer wants to answer the question, how do I calculate time zone difference in hack? What are the next steps? Unfortunately for this developer, Stack Overflow is of no help. And neither is a well-known search engine. Turns out, traditional search engines don't have all the answers, especially in cases where, one, we're working with company-specific code with company-specific domains, and two, we're working with a less common language, such as hack. So in this scenario, what can be done if we're not able to rely on the outside sources for information? Well, as we said before, we at Facebook have a lot of code. So instead of looking externally for information, why don't we look internally? If we were to able to split up the code base into lots of individual code snippets, chances are that somewhere, sometime, someone has written a piece of code that is very similar to what the developer is trying to achieve. And if this is the case, then we can search directly over the large code base that is available to us at Facebook. The challenge now becomes, how do, we write, how do we find that right code snippet out of possibly tens, thousands, even millions of different code snippets? And going back to our example, how do we find the right code snippet that answers our natural language question? Today, I will present a tool that my team has been working on called NCS that is able to answer this exact same question. So let me show you a quick demo of NCS. Here is NCS successfully answering a question that was asked in Stack Overflow. The query is, how to close hide the soft Android keyboard? So we just typed the query, the natural language query, on NCS, and we were able to get actual method bodies that answer this question. And one important thing to note here is that this technology 
goes beyond simple grep search. Because as you can see here, the method bodies don't contain the exact query phrase, but rather encapsulated the overall semantic meaning of this query. So how does it work? How is NCS able to extract the meaning from this query? The underlying technology that drives NCS is a concept called embeddings, which are vector representations of code. And it has a characteristic that semantically similar pieces of code are placed closer in the vector space. So let's see an example of this. Here, both of the method bodies pertain to how to close or hide the soft Android keyboard, but notice that they are not duplicates of each other because they don't share the same lines of code. But they do share similar meaning and intent. And because of this reason, these two method bodies point to points in the graph that are close together. So let's see how we can use this concept to build NCS. This is an overview of the model generation and the search retrieval. And today, I'll cover some main points of this. First, we extract words from source code and tokenize it to produce a linear sequence of words. The information that we extract include method names, class names, string literals, and comments. Tokenizing means that we split up the words by snake and camel case and filter out certain words. After we do this step, each method body is gonna be represented as a linear, natural language looking document. Next, we build word embeddings for each vocab word in the vocab corpus. And it shares the same characteristics as before, that synonyms or words with similar meanings are gonna be, are gonna be represented as similar vectors. Then finally, we take the tokenized words for, and the word embedding vectors and aggregate them together to create a document vector for each method body. And this vector capture the overall semantic meaning of that code snippet. And in this example here, as we saw before, each method body and these two method bodies point to very similar points in the graph because they share a semantic similarity. We repeat the step for every method body in the corpus. So in the end, what we have is we have an index map of each method body or piece of code to its vector representation. And this completes the model training portion of the NCS. Now let's see what happens when a query comes in. Well, we take the query, we tokenize it the same way, and we use the same word embeddings to re represent it as a query vector in the same vector space. And in this example, we can see that this query was mapped to that dot. Then, we compare this vector with all of the other vectors that we have created during the model training. And in this, in this example, we can see that these two method bodies in particular are placed very closely together with the query. This means that these method bodies are semantically similar and very, very relevant to the query. And in a more technical sense, it means that we rank the vectors by cosine similarity and return the top n results. So this is how NCS works in a nutshell. Because NCS is an unsupervised model, it has great advantages. One, you can search directly over the corpus without any outside data or training data necessary. Two, it is fast and easy to train. So let's see some examples. These examples that I'm gonna show are questions that have been asked on Stack Overflow. The first one is how to delete a whole folder and its contents. So you can see here that the results that we see answer exactly what the query is asking for. We type the, the query in natural language. It doesn't have code or method names, but NCS was able to return the right results. And here is another example how to convert image into base64 string. Once again, NCS was able to find the right method bodies. One thing to notice here is that these results are not duplicates of each other. They have different method names, different variable names, but because of the power of embeddings, NCS was able to group these results together. Of course, 
using word embeddings isn't the only possible approach to building such a code search tool. You can take a supervised approach, you know, using deep learning such as LSTMs and RNNs. And our team has explored these various approaches if anyone is interested in talking more later. NCS is built using open source tools. FastText for building word embeddings and FICE for cosine similarity vector search. And I encourage all of you guys to take a look at this along with a paper that we have published which explains NCS more in detail. So this kind of concludes the NCS portion of the talk where we covered where, how we can go from a natural language query to relevant code snippets. But where do we go from here? What if a developer wants to know how that code snippet has been used or what usually comes before or after it? The next speaker, Frank Luan, is gonna answer these questions. All right. Hi, my name is Frank Luan, and today I'm gonna to talk about Aroma. So we have just heard how NCS solved the number one question that every developer has, which is, how do I do something? NCS solved this by enabling answering nat natural language queries directly in a big code corpus by finding the code suite that you need. So imagine now you are an Android developer at Facebook, and you have this question in mind, how, do, how to load an image. Using NCS, you have came up with this line of code, which calls this bitmap factory class and the decode stream method. And this will load the bitmap from a file. Great, you're done. Programming is easy, right? Well, we all know that is not true. Why? Because we're coding in a production environment, and the code that we just wrote can run on millions of devices. Which means you really want to make sure that the code that you, that you just wrote does what it does and will just not crash on people's phones. What this means is that oftentimes we need additional error checks, error handlings, or safety checks around this line of code. In other words, we have a second question in mind now, which is, is there something else I should do? Is this the, is this the full story? Now this used to be a very hard problem because you need to go through documentations and such and such. Um, but don't forget, we're working in a big code base. What this means is that whatever we are trying to do, chances are there's some code somewhere already doing it. For a common task like loading an image, you can expect that there are many places in the pig code base containing very similar code to what we just wrote. What we need is a way to find and see those coding, coding patterns automatically. And this is what we have built, Aroma, an intelligent IDE plugin for code recommendation. Let me show you a demo of how Aroma works. A developer can highlight some, trigger Aroma by highlighting some code, hit a hotkey, and then they get clustered search results that not only contain the code that's currently being written, but also represent idiomatic coding patterns found in the big code base. These all happen automatically and in real time. So let's come back to our example of the bitmap loading. What kind of code recommendations can we get if we have a big code corpus? So here's the first recommendation. Aroma finds that, oops, Aroma, Aroma finds that in five methods in its corpus, not only calls the decode stream method, but also passes in additional arguments to set the sample size. This is, in fact, an important configuration that will reduce the memory consumption while decoding large bitmaps. And again, Aroma has found that in five places, this configuration exists. Maybe we should do something similar in our code. Here's another example. This time, Aroma finds that six methods all contain code about this input stream and that it is idiomatic to close the input stream after use. This means we should also remember to close the input stream to avoid leaking any resources. Let's take a look one more. Now this try-catch block here is found in a cluster of four methods. It handles a potential I.O. exception that could arise when loading the bitmap. Although this code that we just wrote might run smoothly on the emulator, in real-world scenarios, we don't want our app to just crash in case some files fails to open. 
So this is Aroma, a code recommendation tool that lives in the IDE and helps the developer to harness the power of a big code base. It does so by providing real-time code recommendations for the code being written without the need for the developer to go through thousands of code search results. Now that we have seen an example, let's take a deeper look at the magic behind it. Specifically, how Aroma is able to find similar code in a huge corpus and return idiomatic coding, uh, code recommendations. There are a few key ideas here. The first key idea is feature-based search. So think about the problem we're facing. Given some code that we just wrote, how do we find in a code base that contains millions of methods the most relevant concept in terms of syntactical similarity? The idea here is to represent code by vectors. Specifically, given the code bit on the left-hand left side, we first parse it into a syntax tree to get all of the structures, and then take individual features that represent these structures and combine them into one sparse vector. Aroma goes through an indexing stage where the vectors of all methods in the, in the code base are computed and stored in the matrix. Then, all Aroma needs to do when a query comes in is to compare the feature vector of that query code with the, with the matrix. Notice that this matrix multiplication can be done fully in parallel in a fraction of a second, even for millions of code, millions of methods in the code base. The outcome of this phase is a set of method bodies that look similar to the query code on which Aroma can do more fine-grained analysis. The second key idea is clustering. Imagine after the first stage, Aroma has found that five methods um, in the code base contain the query code. But we don't want to show all five of those, especially when they contain similar or duplicate code. What we want is a way to cluster, cluster together the similar results so that we can show idiomatic coding examples. So from these five results, we have identified more similarities in the method themselves. The yellow line here represents the query code, which all of the five uh, methods contain. We also find that in three of the first methods, all contain these two purple lines, uh, which represent some code. And the last result, last two methods, all contain these five new lines showing green. Aroma can do this step automatically and find these clusters and group them together. And then from each of the clusters, it creates one single code recommendation that represents the usage pattern in this cluster. So we have one piece left of the puzzle, which is how exactly does Aroma create one code recommendation from a cluster of method bodies that could contain different code from each other? This is done using a technique we call intersection. So let's take a deeper look at the three methods in the first cluster. Aroma takes the first concept as the base. Then it, it compares the code in the base concept with the second concept. Aroma finds the lines in the base concept that also appears in the second code snippet and preserve it and remove the irrelevant lines. It then takes the result of this first step of intersection and compare it with the next method body. Again, here, we only preserve the lines that appear in both concepts and remove the ones that are not. Now you get the idea. Aroma performed this pruning operation iteratively with each method body in the cluster to make sure that only the lines that are common to all of the methods in the cluster are preserved in the code recommendation, where the details of each different implementation is discarded. This algorithm ensures that the code recommendation Aroma returns represent idiomatic code usages that appear in many places in the code base, so that the, the developer doesn't have to read the local details of individual method bodies. So I've showed you how Aroma can harness the knowledge in a big code base and use it to provide useful code recommendations to developers. But there's more treasure in big code. In fact, there's a whole other dimension of a code that we have not exploited yet, time. For that, I'm going to invite my colleague Johannes on the stage to show you how we can learn more from our constantly evolving code base.
Thank you, Frank. I'm Johannes, and I'm excited to tell you about GetFX today. So you've heard before about the opportunity of scale, what we can do by leveraging the huge code base at our disposal. But this code base also comes with a massive commit history, recording precisely how the code base evolved over time. Sonia and Frank have talked about learning from the code itself, which are the snapshots in this history. Now I'll focus on what we can learn from these countless code changes. Code changes show us how engineers maybe extended their project you know, with new features, but also how they modify existing bits, modernize them, or maybe fix bugs. Getafix searches for patterns among those code changes and attempts to learn how code evolves. If indeed we find patterns of repetitive changes, that means human engineers are doing repetitive work. So the driving question for Getafix is, can we save human developers time by automating repetitive routine work? And it turns out the answer is yes. For example, we can learn how engineers fix bugs. One of the open source tools Facebook uses to detect bugs is Infer. It's a static analyzer and it detects a large variety of issues like deadlocks, resource leaks, or null pointer exceptions. As you can imagine, we run tests and static analysis tools before committing code to master. So fortunately, we can simply look at historical commits and see how many and which warnings were reported. That also means that we can simply search for code changes that get rid of a certain warning, as you can see here, for example. If we look at that specific change, maybe we'll see how a developer fixed the following bug in their app. The line highlighted in pink contains a method invocation that will throw a null pointer exception if v is null. And it's this line that infer would warn us about. The developer fixed this by replacing the method invocation with a conditional expression that guards the invocation in case v is null. Now, imagine we take thousands of these bug fixing edits and search for patterns among them. And indeed, we end up learning a wide spectrum of fixed patterns for just this one single type of warning about null pointer exceptions. The fixes shown here in green are in fact not training data, but were suggest suggested by Getafix during code review and accepted. So how exactly does Getafix surface the fixes it wants to recommend? Well, before, Infer would have posted a warning on our code warning about you know, something it believes to be wrong and leaving an inline comment right there. Now, we get a fix by get a fix. We post that same warning. However, we also show a suggestion of what get a fix believes to be a fix for that warning. And all we need to do to apply this fix is hit accept. Back in the IDE, the same suggestion will be shown. So on a high level, how does get a fix work? As illustrated before, we start by scraping human edits of interest from our massive commit histories. If the goal is to fix a certain type of infer warning, well, then search for human edits that got rid of that infer warning. If the goal is to learn refactorings, we scrape edits doing that. Next, among all those edits, get a fix searches for the most similar pair of edits. Let's assume it picks those two. Edit A happens to be the fix we saw earlier, where v.getWith is replaced by conditional expression. Edit B is structurally identical, only a different variable name and different method name are used. We now calculate a pattern from those two edits that preserves as much information as possible. Since the structure of both edits is identical, the pattern will have that same structure. Both human edits also agree on literals null and zero, so the pattern will use them as well. However, since variable name and method name mismatch, the pattern will abstract those away and introduce new meta variables x and y. Note also that variables are reused whenever possible. So for example, v and lst will always become x in the pattern. We'll repeat this process on and on, meaning Getafix will keep on searching for the most similar pair of edits, or now also edit patterns, and merge them into a new pattern. We stop if the most similar pair of edit patterns is so vastly different that merging them results in nothing meaningful. 
think, for example, of one pattern that's about removing some statement and the other one about adding a null check or something. They have literally nothing in common, so merging them makes no sense. That's where we stop. So we'll end up with a forest of edit patterns with human edits as the leave notes and more and more abstract uh, patterns the further up we go. When presented with a new bug to fix, get a fix will now try to find the edit pattern in this forest that is best for that ver very specific instance of bug. So what does one of those forests look like in practice? This is such a forest of edit patterns, mine from one month of edits to our apps. Here we didn't use specific fixes, edits, like fixes, it's just all edits that happened within one month as training data. The forest is massive, so this is a super zoomed out version of it. But we colored notes to give a rough idea of what's going on. Pink means some code got deleted, green is for new code, and blue means some code got moved around. So if we zoom into this forest, we can investigate what certain subtrees are all about. So what we'll find, for example, are refactorings. For instance, the blue subtree over there, where bits of code moved around. Sprinkled all over the forest, we'll also find common patterns of engineers fixing bugs. And we'll also find the giant footprints of one of our onboarding tasks, where uh, new hires are asked to extend the app in a certain way and later also clean up after themselves and get a fix detects that as those huge green and pink, pink subtrees. So you've seen roughly how Getafix learns to fix bugs, but how well does it work? It turns out we can predict human fixes for the majority of infer warnings with high accuracy. We've been suggesting fixes for several warnings for months now, one of which is the warning about null pointer exceptions uh, we looked at earlier. And we found that in 42% of cases, engineers simply accepted the fix Getafix showed. Recall the example fixes I showed earlier. There are many ways to fix one of those warnings. And Facebook engineers, luckily, are pretty picky about the kind of code, you know, they just accept with a click of a button. For instance, we found another 9% of cases where the engineer did not accept, but then wrote a semantically identical fix, they just wrote it a little different. So yeah, this percentage is not only about getting rid of the warning, you know, infer will not complain anymore, it's also about pleasing a critical reviewer enough for them to just hit accept and move on. So every detail like formatting has to be spot on. As shown before, we roll out those fixes by showing them during code review and we do that for a variety of apps. We also regularly create commits where we just bulk fix a number of issues where we can predict the fix for with high enough accuracy and we've already shipped over 3,000 auto fixes that way. Furthermore, we observed that if we accompany warnings with an auto fix, they get addressed faster. And that's whether it's because engineers just hit accept or maybe they're just you know, motivated to fix it themselves if, if they see a fix suggestion. So overall, get a fix reduces the lifespan of those problems and contributes to code quality. We believe that Getafix can grow in many directions. First of all, it is language agnostic, since the way it learns patterns makes no assumptions about the structure of any programming language or any specifics. At Facebook, we apply Getafix to Java, Objective-C, and Hack already. As you've seen earlier, all Getafix needs as training data is a set of past edits that it can learn from. So we can select that set of past edits based on any code quality signal we like. So far, we've exercised Getafix on Infer and Google Error Prone, but we could also use tools like PMD, Findbox, or maybe just try to fix compiler warnings. Yet another source of training data could be how developers change their code during code review. For example, if a reviewer suggested that you use a different API or write something a little you know, simpler, we believe that from this, Getafix will learn lint rules that point out anti-patterns, just like a human reviewer would, but also learns how to offer a fix suggestion at the click of a button. So with the technology behind Getafix, we can make tasks that are tedious and repetitive so much easier. 
What would we like you to take home from all this? You've seen three simple but effective applications of machine learning, and we hope that you can use some of the ideas in your own development processes and tools. Most of those ideas are available in papers or blog posts and are created using open source technologies. There is a paper for each application you heard about, no code search, aroma, and get a fix. To get an overview, you can also search for aroma or get a fix blog posts. And if you want to learn more about those tools or just exchange ideas, please come talk to us in the open source area. Thank you. <laughs>